Good morning, Lakeside. Good morning, Gordy. I am not Brian with an I. Just thought I'd let you know that. Um, and I also want to know if everybody else is happy with that the chaos is all done. <laughs> We're going to try and get it orderly today. Ha, ha, ha. All right. Um, it's one of those times when we, at the end of the year, of course, we're looking forward to the next year. So when Brian asked, I was like, he asked way too soon because I only went through about five or different subjects that the Lord wanted me to talk about this morning. And we ended up on this one. Now, I don't know about you, but there are times, now, end of the year is always a good time to look, at, look back and say, okay, this is a list of things that I want to do. I actually do this, hopefully, daily. And when I make that list, some people call it a honeydew list. Now, when I make the list, I think I should do things in a certain order. However, being the smart fellow that I am, I say, hey, Jen, what do you think I should do first? <laughs> and she helps me prioritize my list. We are encouraged to prioritize things in our life. If you have been to any of those seminars that talk about how we should do things at work, they get. have you ever seen the one that's got quadrants where the first quadrant is it's urgent and important? And then there's another quadrant, then it says it's urgent, but it's not important. Of course, then you have the quadrants, they say it's not urgent, but it is important. And then, of course, the quadrant that we like to hang out in is it's not urgent or important, but we want to do it anyway. <laughs> Seriously, right? And they always tell you, stay in the urgent and important quadrant. Okay, fine. Even our GPS helps us prioritize the way that we want to go. We can choose the scenic route. Uh, we can say, okay, avoid the toll roads. We can choose the fastest route, which I usually like to do, or we could choose the most direct route. Here's a hint. Most direct is usually not the fastest. We ended up going to a seminar in Madison one time from work, me and another fellow were in our car, and we went the most or the fastest way. Two other individuals decided to put it in their GPS and go the most direct way. They were about an hour, 45 minutes to an hour late because, and they called us. We don't even know where we are. We're on some farmer's road. We're just, <laughs> GPS will take you anywhere if it's, 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 it's the most direct. And even in the church, we talk about prioritizing. And I'm sure you've heard this. We make sure we got God first, family second, and job and career next. We're going to talk a little bit about all this priority stuff. And today, I believe the message does help us all in our moving one step closer to Jesus and reaching those far from him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, once again, we come before you, your children wanting to know a little bit more about you, about the love that you have for us, about the plans that you have for our life. Help each one of us this morning open our ears and our hearts to what you have to say to us this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, Jesus, I said the church has ideas, but Jesus had a different spin on this whole priority thing. Of course, Jesus had a different spin on everything. Have you noticed that? When Brian's up here talking, it's like Jesus did things differently. Oh, really? Okay. But he had the, the difference. Sometimes, and, and the passage that we're going to talk about today is one of those that I've read probably a dozen times before, and this time going through it, it's like, oh, really? Sometimes the Holy Spirit does it. Have you read passages before a dozen times, and all of a sudden you're in your devotion, or you're reading the Bible sometime, and you go, oh, I never, I never even realized that. Philippians 4.13, this is a little bonus, by the way. This is not in the rest of it. Philippians 4.13, I'd heard and I'd learned it through the King James version, all right? It said, I can, in King James, it says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. And I always thought, that's very weird. It shouldn't be which. That doesn't sound English correct. 
And some of the newer translations say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Oh, that makes sense to me. And then one time I was going through it and the Holy Spirit said, no, it's supposed to be which because we can't do everything because Christ strengthens us. Because of Christ, we can only do those things through Christ that strengthen us. I'm like, oh, which does make sense. Our scripture today is, comes from Luke chapter 14, starting in verses 25 and 26. And it says this. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. So, so Jesus, we have to hate everybody to be your disciple, huh? Is that what you're saying? Now, some versions, some translations use that actual word hate. Some of them say, love Jesus more. What Jesus was talking about was kind of a combination of both of these. Our love for Jesus must be so great that all else seems like hate in comparison. Actually, hating everybody would contradict the two greatest commandments, so we know he's not telling us that. Now, when Jesus is talking about this, following him may offend others. It may sever relationships that you've had for years. Family and friends might not understand, and I don't know about you, but we have family and friends that don't understand. Before Jen had a relationship with Jesus, this is years back, she didn't understand why I love Jesus more than her. Okay understandable to put all this in perspective imagine a race to see who wins first place in your life all right imagine this and on the starting line we have jesus your spouse children best friend siblings parents all the important people in your life we're all lined up and they're going to have a race to see who comes in first what jesus is talking about in this scripture is this He doesn't want to come in first place. He wants to be the only one running. He doesn't want to be number one. He wants to be our one and only. So, you're sitting there and you're asking yourself, well, how can we tell if he is our one and only? I'm glad you asked. (laughs) If you... And I've got some questions to ask, of course, you know, having been a teacher before. I have some questions to ask you that may help you understand, is Jesus number one in my life or is he my one and only? How you answer these questions will give you a hint to what, where you're at with him. First question is this, for what do you sacrifice your money? For what do you sacrifice your money? In other words, where does your money go? Jesus said in Matthew 6, 21, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And we all know that following Jesus is a heart issue. Our giving may be an indicator of Jesus being our one and only. Where we spend our money shows What matters the most to us? It doesn't sound like a good thing, but that's what shows what matters the most, where we spend our money. We can take a look at our bank account. If you're not sure where it is that it's going, you can take a look at your bank account, either your checking or your credit cards, anything that has to do with your money. I've uh, been recently in charge of... (laughs) That's kind of a little time of that because... Uh, I am now legally, uh, I'm legal representative for my mom, you know, legal representative, health care, that kind of stuff. So that means that she signed me on to her bank account in case I needed to do, do stuff with the bank account. Well, then that means I look at the bank account to see what's going on. <laughs> I had to let her know after I looked at it for a one-month period, I said, Mom... 
do you know, this is how much you spent on this. I'm not going to tell you everything about it, right? And she went, really? I said, yeah, one month. This is how much you gave away, basically. Sometimes we think we're doing all right with our bank account, and we know where our money is going. We've got to take a look at it. I don't know about you, but every year end, we have to get our taxes together. And one of the things we look at, Jennifer and I, is where did our money go? And did we actually, in other words, we're thinking we've always tithed. We're, do, we're doing a good job with that. Every year we look at the end and say, did we or did we not do what we thought we were doing? You got to take a look at where your money goes to see what you sacrifice your money for. Second question. When you are hurt, where do you go for comfort? When you're hurt, where do you go for comfort? We all experience pain in our lives. It happens. It's just part of being human and living on this planet. But when we experience the pain that comes with whatever it is, where do we go? Do we go to our parent? Do we go to our spouse? Do we go to a close friend? Or do we go to the refrigerator? That's why they call it comfort food. Because some people go to food for comfort. Sometimes we go to work for comfort because we think maybe I'm, if I just made a little bit more money, we, we would be comfortable and everything would be great. So we'll work more. Some people go to the bar for comfort because getting numb is comforting. We may have divided affection if our first response to this pain is something or someone other than Jesus. Just this last week, Pastor Brian was talking about where Jesus said, if you're hurting all you who labor, Come to me. Jesus says, hey, I'm the one that can provide comfort that will last, not all these other things. So we need to remember that. The last time you experienced pain, where did you go? Number three, the third question we need to ask ourselves to tell us if Jesus is our one and only. What disappoints or frustrates you the most? What disappoints or frustrates you the most. If it's something that disappoints or frustrates you the most, it may be too important in your life. Now, there are significant things in our life that, yeah, that would disappoint me or frustrate me. Maybe a loss of a job or maybe you didn't get the promotion that you thought you deserved. I remember back a long while ago when I first started working where I was working, that I was, I, I was told I was hired to be in the training department because that's what I was. I was a trainer. Little did I know that meant that I was going to be a trainee this time. <laughs> I was still in the training department. Anyway, I thought I was supposed to get the promotion to be the trainer. If, if I found out somebody else got the job, I was kind of disappointed. And, of course, in hindsight, I'm very glad that I didn't get it at that time because the individual that got it ended up losing his wife because of all the hours he was working. So sometimes that's a good thing. This, this something that disappoints or frustrates you might be insignificant. I mean, it might be just that you didn't get what you wanted for Christmas, and you're just like, really? Come on. Why not? But that may have been too important. Excessive disappointment or frustration can reveal where our heart is. Now, it might not be evident to you or to yourself, you know, I, is that too important for me or not? It might not just be evident. It might just not slap you in the face that you're placing too much importance on that. So sometimes we just need to ask a close friend or family member, someone we can trust that will tell us whether that thing is too important to us. The fourth question we need to ask ourselves to find out if Jesus is really our one and only is this. What is it that really gets you excited? What is it that really gets you excited? Now, 
We've all been to the football games or been with friends watching a football game, and, you know, we stand up and cheer, and we're hollering, and, yay, this is great. Now, that's not bad. I'm not saying being excited about a football game or who's winning or who's losing isn't, is a bad thing. But the question then comes and says, are we that excited about Jesus? If somebody's watching you be excited about a football game, when they're watching you loving others, are you that excited because you're loving others in Jesus' name? Are you that excited about loving others? Are you that excited about serving wherever it happens to be, whether it's here at church or out in the community? Are you that excited about serving? Do people look at you and say, wow, they really enjoy that serving others thing. Are you that excited about, here it is, going to church and engaging in the service? When you get up in the morning to get ready for church, are you excited about going to church? Or is it another one of those things you just have to do? You don't have to answer that right now. These questions I'm asking you, you don't have to answer them right now. But we do have to take a look at them and answer them ourselves and say, am I really, is Jesus really my one and only? Things that excite us can be in competition with Jesus. That's what we're talking about here. Now, once again, these things that excite us that are not Jesus, they're not bad. But they shouldn't excite us more than Jesus. We shouldn't get more excited about things than we do about Jesus and loving him. When we are following Jesus, he talks about in this in this scripture that he wants to be the only one. He wants us to follow him alone. For you see, Jesus will not share your heart or your infection or affection. He won't share your heart or your affection for money. He won't share your heart or your affection for your career. He will not share your affection or your heart for your family. He will not share you with another lover. That's the way he's put it. He won't share you with another lover. And we look at that and we went, wow, really? How about this? This is a what if, all right? What if I told you that Jen was my number one? We would say, hey, that's pretty good. She's my number one among all the lovers that I have. That is a little different story, is it not? The answer of that is yes, that's different, all right? <laughs> Whew. See, see, Brian has a, this ability to talk about Brooke, and she's not in here, but Jen's in here right now. So. Okay? Yeah, if I was, we, we look at that and we go, of course not. She's your one and only. Yes, she is. She should not have to share my affection with anybody else. I shouldn't have to, to do that. I shouldn't. This whole thing that Jesus is talking about today might seem to be a little possessive or jealous on his part. Jesus might be putting a little much, too much emphasis on him being our one and only. However, we need to realize he's not talking really about how much we love him. He wants to tell us how much he loves us. He wants us to know how much he loves us. It even says in Isaiah chapter 49 that he has your name written on the palm of his hands. Every time he looks, he sees you. He loves you that much that he wants to be your one and only. This was in the fun one to get ready. I'm just telling you this. Because these questions hit my heart as well. I had to look at those questions and say, is Jesus my one and only? But Jesus goes on in this 
passage of Scripture. I need to let you know so you understand what it will cost you to say, yes, I want Jesus to be my one and only. Luke 14, continuing on with verse 28, it says this. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. That's strong words from Jesus. But once again, these strong words come from his heart, wanting us to know how much he loves us. Jesus says this, it may cost you everything to be his disciple. Once again, it may cost you everything, if that's what he asked you. He asked that rich young ruler, did he not? The rich young ruler came to him and was wondering, what do I need to do? And Jesus said, give up all your money, come and follow me. And then, as he turned away, Jesus was sad. Jesus was talking to that rich young ruler, telling him, I love you this much. I love you more than your money. Come follow me. It may cost you your job. I remember working for a company, and I said, if this company, if anybody or this company that I am working for ever shows that it is not valuing integrity and being morally upright and, and doing business the way they should be doing business, I cannot work for a company like that. And it came to be that that company had different management, a, a different management company came in. That management company did not do business. Well, they did it legally, of course. They had to. But ethics and integrity were not a, pr a prime thing for them. And I had to leave. It may cost you other things. We have supported a ministry that takes Bibles in and helps Muslims understand how much Jesus loves them. And these Muslim converts, we hear story after story after story. When they convert from Islam to Christianity, they lose their families. They kick them out. They lose their homes. And many of them, yes, in this day and age, still lose their life just because they refuse to give up Jesus. Because they love him that much. This invitation from Jesus we're talking about today, it's a little different than the, well, now that you've heard the message, I would like you to bow your head, close your eyes, and repeat after me, and then everything will be wonderful. Sometimes we think that that's what Jesus is calling us to. To just say, well, I'll do that, and then we'll go on from here. Today, the question I have to ask you is this. If it costs you, if it costs you everything to follow Jesus, if it cost you everything to follow him, would it still be worth it? Father in heaven, we come before you this morning, your children. Lord, we want you to be our one and only. We want you to take the throne in our life. We want you to be everything to us. And Lord, this morning, as we contemplate all these different questions, 
Lord, we ask you to help us. Help us take a look at our life. Help us take a look at all these different things, the things that excite us, our money, our finances, all the different things that sometimes vie for your attention, for our attention. Help us take a look, a real look at our life and say, yes, Lord, we want you to be our one and only. We want you to come in and with the power of your Holy Spirit live a life that shows you that we love you, that you are our one and only. Lord, we know that all those other things still have a place in our life. But compared to our love for you, compared to how we interact, compared to our relationship with you, that all falls away. So help us, Lord, each one of us, to take the words that have come from you and hide them in our heart, treasure them in our heart, If anything came from me, Lord, we don't have to listen to it. But we do need to listen to what you have to say to us. We thank you. We praise you. We'll give you all the honor and the glory. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.